In today's video, I show you Dungeoneers, a print and play dungeon crawl. Before we get into today's video, just want to share what the GGGG is for this month. And for this month of August of 2021, we have a number of them. One patron is going to be receiving this fully painted set of the Ancient Evil City Crawler, as well as receiving the STL files to print out more of them, as well as the PDF of Dungeoneers. So you'll have everything that you need in order to play this game. And also Michael offered up four more copies of these PDFs. So four more patrons will be receiving that. And a few more patrons will also be receiving the STLs for the Ancient Evil City Crawler. In addition, we have a fully printed and painted Hagglethorn Hollow Tower. And as usual, later on this month, we'll be voting on the crowdfunder. So make sure you check out my link below in the descriptions to go to my Patreon page to get in on that. I did want to highlight this ancient evil city crawler from Colin. He's the one who did Star Crawler. And if you haven't seen my video showcasing that, go ahead and check that out here. But this was designed to be used with Cursed City from Games Workshop. I also made a video about that and overall I was very disappointed in it. But this is a great 3D dungeon set that you, not only can you use with Cursed City tiles, but as you can see here, I've adapted them to be able to be used for other dungeon crawlers. And in this case, it works great for Dungeoneers. The only drawback is they are designed to fit 40 millimeter tiles. So I had to increase the printed uh, floor tiles from Dungeoneers in order to fit that. But as you can see, it's totally worth it because it makes a set 3D and totally having that awesome tabletop presence. So again, check out links below to go over to his website to see more details about this awesome set. It is fully magnetized, so it's very quick to set up and tear down. Personally, I did back the Kraken Dungeons Kickstarter in order to be able to use for Dungeoneers. So my intention is once I'm done printing all of those pieces to use that as my primary set for Dungeoneers. But again, this is a great alternative as well. So Dungeoneers is a print and play from Michael Lundstedt. He is from Sweden and I am just amazed that he wrote a book in his non-native language in English. The fact that he can create a rule book like this, it's just amazing to me. And I do have links in the descriptions below for all the resources that I'm going to share with you today. And you'll also want to check out the Board Game Geek site, which again, I linked below in order to see what all uh, updates and resources that are available. Also, I know that he just posted the rule book so that you can get it printed professionally, which I would highly suggest. Uh, US dollars is $22 for both the rule book and the quest book. I think it's combined so that you can print it as one book. And that is much more economical because for me, even to just go to Office Depot to print these out uh, cost me close to $50. So uh, it's definitely a deal to have it printed for you, especially since it's going to be in color. Mine is all black and white. Also, I want to say that the version that I have is 1.5.1. Since I printed this out, he has come out with version 1.6 and he is continually updating and revising. So make sure you go to Board Game Geek and see which is the most current version. So I broke up this video into a couple of different sections because it's fairly long. First, there's going to be an overview where I don't really go into the rules, but um, go into just playing through a little bit, a couple of turns so that you can get a sense or an idea of how the game plays. Then after that, I'm gonna go into the rules in more depth and detail. So you can skip that part if you're not really interested in that. But for those of you who want to know a little bit more of the choices that you might have as a player, go ahead and watch that section. And finally, I do have a section where I do talk about the optional resources that you can have 
to make this game. So for example, I have a tutorial on how to make these tokens, other options for your 3D board, all of the downloadable resources and tools that you can get, even one of them that I made. Some of them are linked in the descriptions below for a direct download. Others of them will be found on the Board Game Geek channel. But I do want to dive right in before we get into the overplay that I really do like this game a lot. Now, this might be surprising to some of you because most of the rule sets that you see on my channel, I say that I like streamlined and simpler and faster rule sets. And overall, that's true. But what I'm finding from this game, as well as Wasteland Warfare, which is also a crunchy rule set, is that it isn't so much that I want a simple rule set. It's more that I don't appreciate bloated rule sets that have rules uh, for no reason at all. Even Michael says pretty much at, from the beginning, this is not a simplified rule set. You're going to be doing a lot of paperwork, writing a lot of things down and looking at charts. And you would think that I would not like this game based off of that. But I'm finding this game to be really fun and especially as a soloable game because you can play with other characters, but I actually prefer to play this game by myself. Um, I have that drive to try to upgrade my characters. I want to get more gold so that I can purchase the items that I want and even uh, how hard the game can be and punishing that the game can be because it's difficult to gain gold, uh, to heal your um, psychological disorders, takes a ton of money. And so this game can be difficult and hard, but I think I like that level of difficulty. It isn't super easy because it makes me drive towards, oh, if I just get a little bit more gold, I can purchase that crowbar, which makes it so that I can open locked doors a little bit easier. And so it's that incremental drive to improve your character purchase supplies, get treasures, get more experience, all that kinds of stuff is what draws me into this game. So I really like that a lot. In many ways, I prefer playing this game over Chronicles of Drunagor, and I can't 100% sure tell you why that's the case, uh, because I do think Chronicles of Drunagor is easier to play, but maybe the challenge of this is intriguing to me and has pulled me in more where I'm actually playing this game more than I am Chronicles of Drunagor. So let that be my endorsement that you should definitely check this out, especially at only $10. Uh, this is sort of a no-brainer. You can download this and read it for yourself and start playing and, and check it out yourself. So let's go ahead and first look at the overview so that you can get a sense of how the game plays. And Tiny, my halfling, is going to go ahead and open the door. And with the first door, you don't have to make any rolls. It's automatically not trapped and is not locked. So he's going to spend his first action opening the door. And we're going to reveal this top card. And it is a seven of spades. Here in the quest book, the seven of spades is a quarter. So I'm going to go ahead and place this. And you can place it however way that you want. So I'm going to go ahead and just put it right in the middle, like so. Then I'm going to build out the walls. Next we're going to roll for an encounter and in quarters it's 30%. So no encounter, I rolled a 57. Then I'm going to take my deck here, set this aside and distribute the remainder of the cards evenly. I deal from the bottom on both doorways. Tiny's gonna move. One, two, three. Jim is also gonna move. One, two, three. Genevieve. One, two, three. And then Maurice. One, two, three. It took an action just to move, but they didn't have anything else to do for their second action. Top of the next turn, gonna roll the scenario die. Two, nothing happens. And before they open this door, they are going to actually search the corridor. I'm gonna use a perception of um, Maurice and Tiny as their perception is the best out of the party. So I need to, in a quarter, I need to make two successes. First for Maurice, I need a 53. I got a 93, so uh, definitely didn't make it. 
Top of the round scenario die again. Four, nothing happens. Again, Tiny, my thief, is going to try to open the door. It is trapped, but it is not locked. Five. Poisonous gas. Room fills with poisonous gas. But I go ahead and make a roll, though, to see if he spots the trigger. Again, Tiny's perception is 39. 67, so he failed. So the room fills with poisonous gas, and everyone takes D6 damage. Jim's constitution is 46, 67, he fails, so he takes D6, just one point of damage. Genevieve's constitution is 49. Go ahead and roll the damage die with this. Oh, zero, 01. So whenever you roll anywhere between a one and a five, you can actually either choose to regain an energy, which I already have my max energy, or I can increase that stat by one point. So her constitution goes up to 50. And she avoids the damage. Tiny's constitution is 30. 49, so he fails and takes five points of damage. He is down to half health which means that he is now wounded and that takes away one of his actions, so he only has one action. And I put my status tokens here on the board. And then finally, Maurice's constitution is 35. 61, she fails and takes five points of damage. Also, when springing a trap, the sanity falls to minus two, so Tiny's Sanity is going to drop down to as well. The party morale is going to drop by one because of this So party morale goes down to 14. So after all that happened the door will be opened by tiny Threat level automatically will go up one and we flip this over and it's the eight of hearts now, I know this isn't the eight of hearts. It's actually a smaller room but uh, this is the one I printed out, so we're gonna go ahead and use this tile, and this system is flexible with tiles this way. But we will go ahead and use the features of this room, and so this is the monster's den, and there is a small pile of gold in here as well. Uh, we need to decide what monster is residing in here, and there is a plus 10% chance of an encounter, in which case the monster will be residing in there. So let's go ahead and roll for the encounter roll first. Normally in rooms it's 50%, but with the plus 10 is a 60%. 32, so that definitely is a monster. So it is a Minotaur with a Great Axe Armor 2. So let's see where it is placed. You can place randomly, except for these two spots that have to remain open. So one over and then three down. So he's going to be here in this corner. I know this isn't a Minotaur either, but it's a large figure from Rune Wars. So here are the stats for a Minotaur uh, 52 CS and has armor two. And right now we want to look at the dexterity, which is 40 because we have to roll for initiative so 24, which is lower than his dexterity. That means we win the initiative and we continue our turn. So again, Tiny opened the door. He has one action left and he's just going to enter in. Jim the dwarf is going to move up and attack. He's gonna use his first action. One, two, three, four. Normal rule is that once you go into the zone of control that you have to make a dex check, but I use the alternative rule where it is difficult terrain to move once you're inside the zone of control. So that was his first action and he is gonna go ahead and attack. He has a two-handed warhammer and his two-handed combat skill is 60. But again, we have to look at the two hit modifier of minus 10, so he needs a 50. So lower is better. And he rolled an 11, which is definitely a success. 
This Warhammer has 2d6, and because of his damage bonus of his high strength, he gets a plus three to that. 11 plus three is 14 points. He goes from 26 hit points to 12. And because that's more than 50% of his hit points, he also is now wounded. Maurice is gonna go next and she is going to cast Flare, which is basically magic missile. And all she needs to do is rather than to hit is to make a arcane check which for her is 53. Maurice does have line of sight and range is 10 squares for all ranged attacks. She does need to reduce the cost of the spell, which is eight. So the difficulty level is 45. She rolled 60, which is a fail, but because that was a, a quick spell, she, it only took one action. She's going to use her second action to cast it again. Oh, and she got 10. She does 1d10 plus her magic level, which is first level, and then an additional damage because she has powerful missiles. Five plus two is seven more. And our Minotaur is down to five. Genevieve the elf is actually gonna move forward. So one, two, three for her first action. And then she is going to take the parry stance. Now that all the heroes have gone, it is the Minotaur's turn. And we see that it is a beast using the beast behavior card. So we use this AI stat, if adjacent to a hero, attack according to the table. So I roll a D6 which is five, which uses a skill or special talent. It has ferocious charge as a special rule. Can't use it because he's already in melee. It's signifying that it's large, which basically means makes it easier to hit with ranged weapons. But because of their size, they deal um, damage. They deal more damage, so you roll the damage dice twice and select the best roll. But the only special ability that it has is Bellow, which it's gonna use now. So the creature will roar at the top of his lungs and any hero within four squares will be stunned unless they pass a res test. So four squares is gonna affect all of these guys, but not Maurice, who is more than four squares away. So let's do res test for everyone. Genevieve's res is 40. She fails, so she's gonna take a stun token, which basically gives her only one action. Jim's res is 49. 79, he fails as well. Finally, Tiny's res is 34. 68, he failed too, so everyone is stunned. So he used this special skill for his first action, but because he is wounded, that's the only action he can take. Otherwise, we would roll again and see what other ability he would use. Nine, so on a nine or 10, you do have to roll on the threat table. Our threat level right now is three. So we rolled above it, which means nothing happens, but we do raise the threat level one more, and so now it's at four. All right, so Tiny can't do anything this round because he is both wounded and is stunned. So all he does for his turn is to remove the stun marker. We also remove Genevieve's parry token because it only lasts one round. And she is gonna go ahead and attack. She has a battle hammer. First she needs to spend an action to switch. She had her bow out, but now she's gonna pull out her battle hammer. Jim is gonna do another war hammer attack. Needs a 50. 41 hits. Seven plus three is 10. So the Minotaur actually is killed. 
Party morale is plus two for slaying a large monster. And threat level does go up one more after you win a combat. Maurice is gonna move forward, one, two, and use her second action to try to heal up Tiny. Her arcane art skill is 53. And then the healing hand is a CL of seven. So it needs to roll a 46. The reason why I moved up is it is touched, so she has to be right next to him. 89 failed. And the Minotaur did drop some loot, uh, treasure three. Here on the T3 table, we roll a D10. A five, which is a mundane treasure. We roll on this chart. 35, a piece of armor up to leather class. Normally you roll a D20 on the table of armors, but because we're only going up to leather class, we're gonna roll a D10. A six means we received a leather skull cap. And then remember up here, mundane treasures get a plus two on the quality table. So when you receive any treasure, you do have to roll for quality. And so here we're gonna roll a D10 and add two. So eight actually makes it a 10. It is in bad shape. And it comes with five points of wear. So one more point and it breaks and it's unusable. So we should repair it as soon as possible. Let me go ahead and show you really quickly what it would have looked like if the Minotaur did end up being able to get an attack off just so that you can see what that looks like. So let's say it's the beginning of his turn. We would roll whether or not he would use his special ability. This time we roll a three. So we would he would be doing an attack action. We would typically roll again and this time it would do a standard attack. But in actuality we wouldn't need to roll because he only has one action due to wound he would only be able to do the standard attack. Power attack is basically using two actions, his full two actions, in order to get a plus 20% to the CS. But let's go ahead and do a standard attack, which only costs one action point. So the Minotaur's combat skill is 52. Let's roll this. Basically it rolls a two, which is definitely a hit. Heroes, when they roll anywhere between zero and five, that is called bloodlust, where they roll their damage dice twice and pick the higher of the two. Monsters and en enemies don't actually benefit from this. And because the Minotaur is large, it has that benefit anyway innately. So this is just a successful hit. Damage for Minotaurs are automatically threes. And because he has a great axe, his base damage is 1d12 plus four, but he gets an additional three on top of that. So that's devastating. So we roll this. Oh, that's 18 points of damage. Uh, we pick randomly, one, two, three, four, five, six. That is um, on Tiny. He's already down to five hit points, but he does get a dodge roll here and that's his dexterity, so 57. Forty-eight. Uh, just makes it. So basically he avoids all that damage, which is fortunate. Oh, and we had to see where he was getting hit. For on the location table is his torso. Tiny does have a leather vest at his torso, which would take away three of those 18, uh, but obviously that wouldn't have helped him at all. And because it's more than three and he doesn't block the damage, it would get a check mark for condition. Minotaur actually would have rolled twice and picked the higher of the two, which was 11 anyway. Basically when a hero has the parry icon and takes an action to do that, when they're attacked, they get a plus 20% onto their parry or dodge roll. So that, that's why sometimes it's helpful to take this. Now you can only dodge or use this plus 20% for one incoming attack. So that was a quick overview. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of a flavor for how the game plays and the personality of the game so that you know what you're getting yourself into. 
At this point, I do want to go into a little bit more detail of the options that you have, how the turn order uh, happens, why you're rolling some dice, as well as the options that you have in combat and in battle. Again, the beginning door is never locked, nor is it trapped, so you don't have to roll for those things. But Tiny did spend an action to go ahead and open the door. It, uh, we drew a card, revealed this passageway, and then now we would roll for whether or not there is an encounter. Uh, here in passageways, it's 30%. Rolled a 49, so there is no encounter. So he can finish his second action by moving and all heroes have a movement of four and I could choose to spend an action, uh, first action move up to four and then I could also spend my second action to move again but when you move a second time you only have two movements. So the most you can move in a turn is six spaces. But I don't need that many, I'm just gonna move up to here. I only need three movement in order to do that. Also facing is important because a hero's um, zone of control is actually one, two, three, four, five. The, the side, two side spaces and then the three in the front. That is the zone of control for both heroes and monsters. And anytime an enemy comes inside the zone of control, then I use the alternative rule instead of rolling decks to see whether or not I can continue movement. I use the alternative rule where it's just double movement to move within the zone of control like this. So facing is important. And whenever someone attacks from the back spaces, which are the three spaces directly behind, they will get a plus 20% to their CS or their two hit roll. So facing and placement is important. Turning is always a free action during your turn, so don't worry uh, about that too much. But Tiny's gonna go here, and then all of these guys are gonna spend their turns to also move up. They're pretty much wasting their second action. And then it is gonna be the start of the next turn. Uh, first thing you do is roll the scenario die and anything that is not a 9 or 10 means nothing else happens with the threat. But let's go ahead and say I did roll a 9. After rolling a 9 or 10, I do have to roll a d20 and compare it to the current threat level. And the reason why I have this here is that 12 is the trigger for this overall scenario. So once this hits 12, uh, automatically something happens. But right now it's at 5, so let me go ahead and roll. I did roll under five or under, that actually does trigger an event. But let's say I rolled higher than five, here it's a 12, nothing else happens except that this is raised up one. So as time goes by, it becomes uh, increasingly possible for a bad event to happen. But let's go ahead and do the original roll for under five, I think it was a three. And at this point, we roll again. Because we're out of combat, we roll the d20 again, and it is eight, and eight is a wandering monster has appeared. And then we would reduce this down because it's minus five, but the lowest level for this scenario is two, so it would go back down to two. So as things are triggered, then you have a little bit more breathing space and time, but let's go ahead and pretend that that didn't trigger, and that'll keep building up. Uh, again, beginning, still beginning of the round after we took care of all of the threat. And Tiny, again, he's gonna be the one that's gonna attempt to open the door. So he spends an action to attempt to open the door. And then we're gonna roll a six to see if it's trapped and then a D10 to see if it's locked. So if you roll a six, then the door is trapped. So it's not trapped. And then if you roll on the D10, uh, one to six is that it's open, so you can open it fine. And then uh, nine to 10, it is locked with various uh, amounts of difficulty for opening it. Let's say that it was locked. Let's say I rolled a nine. Then it's locked and my thief would have a minus 15% to open it. So Tiny's pick lock is 57%, so minus 15 is 42. So he rolls this dice. I got a 69, so he failed to open the door. 
Now, uh, trying to pick the lock uh, does take two AP, so Tiny's turn would have been over, but he failed, and so instead, what you can choose to do is bash down the door, so the door has 20 wounds. So since Tiny failed, Jim is gonna go ahead and try to bash the door. Oh, when you do attempt to open a door, uh, it will, go threat level automatically goes up one. So when you're trying to bash a door, it is automatically hit. You don't have to roll to hit, so you just roll damage. Tiny's hammer is a 2d6 plus three. So there he did seven points of damage. And then for a second action, he's gonna attack it again. The bad thing though with bashing is whenever you attempt to force open a door, you increase the threat level by two because you're making so much noise. So that would have increased it by two. Now, it still has hit points, so he's gonna try again. So it's gonna increase again by another two. So threat level is increasing a lot. So rolling damage again. So six is nine more points this time. There's four hit points left. He's gonna to have to wait because he spent his two actions. These two back here can't really do anything to help out. So it's the next round. We're rolling our scenario die. We rolled a four, so nothing happens. Tiny will go ahead and try to pick the lock again. That takes two actions. He needs a 57. And this time he makes it with a 15. So the door is opened. And again, let's say we flipped over the card. Rather than the scenario dictating what's in here, let's go ahead and roll whether or not there is an encounter. Rooms are 50%, 49, so there is going to be an encounter in this room. In the quest book, each of the quests might have a quest specific encounter table, which the first one does. So we're gonna roll here to see what appears. 76 is 1d2 giant snakes. There, that's gonna be two giant snakes. I'm gonna be using the Snake Men miniatures from Shadows of Brimstone. Again, place them randomly uh, anywhere except for these two squares. One, two, one, two, three. One and four, so they are both back in the corner. Now I did create these monster cards for all of the ones in the first scenario and links in the descriptions below if you wanna modify the Word document. It is a Word document, so you have to have Word in order to make your own monster cards. Can't be posted in BGG because these images were pulled out of Google searches, so because of copyright, uh, we can't post them, but you can use these cards and again, uh, just download using the link below. So Giant Snake has all the stats here as well as special rules. The only special rule is that they can poison. So I have to make a con check whenever I get hit, successfully hit by these snakes. Important thing to note here is dexterity, which is 60. So we are rolling for initiative. So basically here in this flow chart of opening a door, which is super handy, page 51, um, rolling a D100 and then Less than 10, the enemy surprises us. We're actually pushed back one space and they're moved up uh, closer to us. If it's less than the enemy dexterity, we lose the initiative. So whatever turns that we had are lost and they actually activate first. And then if we are higher than the enemy's dexterity, then we will continue our turn. And then finally, if it is above 90, the enemies are placed with their back towards the party so that we get that benefit, 20, a plus 20 to hit by being in the rear of their models. But because we broke down the door, or at least we tried to break down the door, made tons of noise. Um, even if we roll above a 90, we still might gain the initiative, but we can't hit them from the back. So again, trying to get above 60. So we got 96, so we do maintain initiative. So actually Tiny did use his two action points to pick that lock, so he is done. 
And one thing to note about movement is that you cannot move through other figures, nor do you have line of sight through other figures. Because Tiny is already gone, the best option for me is to move him because these two back here can't fight or shoot or move through these frontline folks. So oftentimes when I do lose initiative, there is a bottleneck here at the door because the enemies will oftentimes fight right up against the door and it gets really hard to have the backline folks be able to do anything because they don't have line of sight. In that case, you will need to use a push. So let's use that as an example here. Let's say we were bottlenecked like this. I would choose to try to shove uh, one of the snake men with my dwarf. That costs one action point and the model has to be either the same size or smaller, which I think dwarves are normal size, I'm not sure. So basically I have to roll against their dex, which again is 60, but I get to add my damage bonus times 10. So because he has a damage bonus of three, he's gonna add 30 to this roll. And because he had 71, that would be 101. That definitely is more than their 60 dexterity. So I would be able to push him back one and also follow up. So that's gonna create some space for one of them to be able to come through. So let's go ahead and reset back to what it was before. It's Jim's turn and he has a couple of options. One is he could spend one action point to move ahead, like one, two, three, and then attack. Or he chooses to do a charge action. And in order to do a charge attack, it costs two action points. You have to be at least two squares away and then move up to your max, uh, which is four, and then you actually are able to strike them with a plus 10 to your CS. So let's go ahead and charge. I'm gonna spend two AP, so one, two, three. I'm gonna go ahead and hit him. Jim has a CS of 60, but with the plus 10, it's gonna be 70. I rolled a seven, so I clearly uh, came in and hit him. Genevieve here has a couple of options. She does need to load an arrow into her bow, which is an action. Now she could have done this previously before the door was open so that she did have a notched arrow, but she didn't do that. So she's gonna spend an action. Also, you get a free load action for ranged weapons while you're moving. So let's say she chose to spend an action to move. So one, two, three she could at that point also get a free load action with that move. So let's go ahead and do that. Then for her second action, she is actually gonna fire. So Genevieve is gonna go ahead and target this giant snake. And for using her bow, she does use her range skill, which is dex based and it is 63. She rolls a 92, so she failed to hit. So I need to flip this over saying that she needs to reload before she can shoot again. Oh, you know what I forgot to do, which isn't a huge deal um, since I missed, but I should have been applying the minus 20 to their two hit. And then Maurice's turn, she's gonna spend an action to move. So one, two, three, four. And for a second action, she's actually going to focus and she will gain one point of focus, which she'll use next turn. Now, since all the heroes have gone, the snake men will go next. So this one's adjacent and just attacks. So roll a D6, got a two, which is a normal attack. Let's see if it's a power attack. It is a power attack. So CS is going to be 50, but power attack is a plus two. So that's gonna make it a 70. So 64 is a success. So we will put a power attack token so that we remember that he did perform a power attack. And then damage is gonna be 1d8. A seven. So on Jim, we reduce him down to six, which is less than half. which shows that Jim is now wounded, and for next turn, he's only gonna have one action available to him. He's also gonna be potentially poisoned, but he gets a constitution check. So Jim's constitution is 46. He gets a five, and again, kicks in the either bonus 
one to his constitution now, so that would become 47, or he can get an energy back, which he doesn't really use energy at first level. So he would opt to raise this up. But let's say he failed and he is then poisoned. The bad thing about poison is that at the start of every turn, he's gonna make a constitution check. And every time he fails, he loses a hit point. So this just keeps happening throughout the rest of the dungeon and scenario. The only way that you can cure poison is either have a cure poison potion, which we don't have, or he goes to the chapel of Mathia back in the city. This isn't cumulative, but it is pretty nasty. Before he received any of that damage or anything like that, he would have gotten a dodge roll, even though he didn't take the parry stance. But for the sake of the demo, I just wanted to show you what a successful hit would have looked like. For the second snake, let's see what he does. Their movement is six. If within six spaces of a hero, perform a charge attack against the closest hero. So the closest hero is actually Jim. So he's going to charge and he is two spaces away. So he's gonna get a plus 10 to his normal CS of 50. So it's gonna be 60. And got a two, so that is successful. This time I am gonna roll my dodge roll for Jim and he has a dodge of 30. 61, so he fails to dodge. He's gonna take another D8 of damage. Oh, good. Uh, one hit point of damage is down to five. And that took up both actions because charge is two actions. So they're done. It's the beginning of the next turn. We're gonna go ahead and even though they're in combat, you do still roll the scenario die. Seven, so nothing happens. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to heal with my mage. So even though she was ramping up to actually attack, um, she can still use her focus point to get a plus 10% to her mag her arcane roll. Oops, I forgot when I first took the focus action, I needed to make a res check. So let's go ahead and do that now. Maurice's res is 45. 89, that would have failed, but let's say she did succeed and did receive the focus token. So this is gonna be plus 10 to arcane skill. So I'm gonna go ahead and use my arcane skill, which is 53. I'm gonna get a plus 10 to that, so it's 63. But then look at my healing hand, which is a touch. I have to be adjacent to the person I'm healing, and it has a CL of seven. So I subtract seven from 63. That makes it a 56. So 35, I did pass and I do heal um, D10 plus magic level, which is one. So I would heal Jim seven points. So he's back up to 12. And the most important thing is that removes his wounded token. So now he has his full two actions, his turn. But let's say I rolled a 90 during my arcane roll. Normally, a 95 and above is a miscast, but for every focus that you use, it reduces that by five. So instead of it being 95 and above miscast, now it's 90 and above. So if I would have rolled a 90 and above, I would have a miscast. What happens then is that the spell doesn't go off, I wouldn't have been able to heal, and her entire turn ends immediately. I lose 1d3 sanity points. So here I would have lost one sanity point off of my character. The other bad thing about miscast is it reduces the party morale by one. So miscasts are really bad. Uh, they end up being crazy or having a disorder and the party morale is reduced by one. If your party morale ever gets to zero, you have to abandon the quest. Everyone has to go back to town. You just leave the dungeon. The interesting thing about magic users is because that, that was a quick cast, it only took one action to cast that healing. There are other spells that take more than one action point. So just be, uh, just note that. So for example, uh, let's say I failed the first roll to heal and uh, didn't get a miscast, but I just failed. The spell doesn't go off. I can use my second action to try again to try to heal him. Now the focus would have been used the first turn, so I would just have to roll again in order to heal and here I would have succeeded the second time. So she can be a healing machine and just spam healing as long as she's next to a person. 
So healing in this game is actually relatively easy if you have a wizard. Typically it is a cleric or a paladin that can heal and that's one of the reasons why I made my dwarf a warrior priest. But it is the wizard that actually does healing. The other way to heal in this game is if you do take a short rest, you do take up a ration and as long as you eat a ration, you can heal 2d6 hit points. This is on page 48. And you can possibly renew energy, which is you roll a d6 per energy point and a result of one to three will replenish that energy point. And wandering monsters will move three times during the break. And if the wandering monster spots them, then the benefits of the break uh, doesn't happen. As I mentioned before, the dodge enables you to be able to add 20 to your dodge or parry. I almost never parry, I only dodge because parrying might damage my weapons. And one of the things I forgot to roll for is the location of each one of these hits. So you roll this die and you look here because uh, currently all of my heroes only have armor at the torso. And whenever you're hit at the torso, you do take away the armor that's available there. So if he would have gotten hit at the torso, he, Jim who has leather there would take three away. But each time that it is hit and it can't absorb all the damage, then you do check off another condition marker and at six points, that item is broken and can't be used anymore. The way that you repair items is that you pay half price of the original buying price of it in order to get rid of all of the condition markers. The only other actions here to go through is that you can do a feint for one action point. So basically instead of hitting them, you do a feint and it basically makes that enemy lose its defense mod. So in this case, the minus 22 hit would go away. Also, when, you, when an enemy does, or when you do a power attack, you are no longer able to defend. So he would lose his defense mod. So if Jim were to attack him, it would just be a straight CS without the modifier. So be careful of when you use your power attacks. And then finally, you can change gear or equip or use anything from the ready slots. You have three ready slots that you can put stuff in. The rest has to go in your backpack and it takes two action points when there's no enemies around to move things from your backpack to ready slots. So there are a bunch of other rules. Again, you know, traps, not only for doors, but also there can be room traps. There's different kinds of damage that happens. Uh, some monsters require you to take a fear check, which if you fail, you get minus 10 to your combat or your range skill, as well as your arcane arts. There are also rules for when you are back in the city, um, how to level up, what other things that you can do. You can even gamble and try to win money. You can go to the temples in order to be healed. Although uh, healing does cost a lot of money, there is a bunch of leveling up options that increases your stats as well as gives you more hit points and gives you luck, which enables you to spend the luck to reroll any die roll and energy, which is what you need to be able to perform perks. There are also rules for when you travel. Every day that you travel does require a ration, so you need to keep track of your food because that enables you to travel. You are able to forage. I have a ranger that enables foraging to happen to provide meals. And once per day, you do have to roll for events and that event table is in the quest book. And whenever you have skirmishes, you actually have it on an outdoor board or tiles. And instead of using squares, you are just using inches for movement and range. One important thing to note is that anyone can attempt to disarm traps. So when a trap does go off and you use a perception check and you notice that the trap is there, you don't have to be a thief to attempt to disarm traps, although obviously being a thief gives you a higher chance of that happening. Also, when you're creating a character, just note that it took me a while to realize that talents that is mentioned here on page 11, uh, go to page 77 for the list of talents. That's in the back, not in the section where you roll up your characters. There are a ton more rules than I covered even here. And so I suggest that you do check out some other videos that are available. Again, go to Board Game Geek and you'll see 
uh, some videos that are available. Michael himself has a whole channel, a multi-video um, series that he goes through the first scenario and you can follow along and see how he does some of his rules. Word of warning, even he gets some of the rules wrong. So uh, just note that. And I do know that he's gonna be coming out with some updated tutorial videos, but hopefully this is enough to let you know what you're getting yourself into. Now let me tell you about some of the resources, op and a lot of these are optional and they are upgrades, but as you know from my channel, I'm all about 3D dungeons and upgrading everything because the tabletop presence is as important to me as is the rule set. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the first thing is 3D dungeon. I think this is a great option and a relatively cheap option. So if you have a 3D printer, go ahead and check out Colin's Ancient Evil uh, crawl, City Crawl. And again, links in the descriptions below. It's relatively cheap. And he is continually developing and evolving the system so that you can use them. These stairs are actually from Fat Dragon Games. So I tend to piece together my dungeon. Uh, this is not included in the GGGG for the month, just the walls and the doors. And as I mentioned before, I think Kraken Studios, because it was based off of the original Warhammer Quest, it's gonna fit this really, really well. If you want to see any future gameplay videos of me using that set, uh, go ahead and request that in the descriptions below. I tend not to like sort of battle reports or uh, just pure gaming videos because I find them to be boring and really long and hard to edit. But if there's enough of you that are interested in that, I am willing to do that. More importantly are probably some of these resources. So I did create a little cheat sheet that does contain all of the enemy special rules that is in the core rule book, but I wanted a card of it, a quick reference card so that I could look it up really quickly here. Also, the reason why I put it in word format is so that I could make my own monster cards as I showed you before. That way I could just copy and paste what was found here directly onto these cards because all of their special rules and abilities are on uh, these cards and I'm able to just reference all of it just by looking at a card. These cards you can download. Um, they can't be loaded up onto BoardGameGeek, but you can download them if you use the link in the descriptions. And there are options to print out things. So for example, all of the AI cards, again, it's sort of in list format in the rule book and you can print that out as well. But I think having these cards just makes it a lot easier to reference because as you can see, there's a ton of paperwork that you have to have at your table. And this just makes it a little bit easier. I would also highly recommend instead of using these cards, printing out the room cards instead and using those instead. Now, the reason why I didn't do that is because I am adapting different tiles. I'm not using the tiles that come with Dungeoneers. And because of that, it's more helpful for me to look at the chart and see what the features are in those rooms because I can just adapt that for my Kraken Studios 3D printed board instead. You saw me using the quick reference card that Michael also provides that is a lifesaver. Go ahead and print that out. And again, using this party sheet right here, this campaign sheet, I think is super, super helpful, especially if you're doing it solo and you have to keep track of everything. This makes it really manageable. All right, so after you 3D print all of these out, I use black PLA at 0.2 millimeter height. Uh, again, um, this file you can find in Thingiverse, links in the descriptions below. Um, so you can use sticker paper or uh, label paper. I would suggest using label sticker sheets, which is the entire sheet. Um, here I'm just using cardstock, but either way, cardstock and some super glue, but either way, you're gonna need a three quarter hole punch and I do cut up the sheets like this just so that I can access uh, these graphics tokens a little bit easier and line it up and just punch it out like that. And then grab your token and at least with cardstock or you know you can use regular Elmer's glue, it really doesn't matter. I just use this because it's fast and just stick it on there, center and stick it on there. And you just, if you're using super glue, you just need a little dab. And there you have it. 
So as a wrap up, uh, like I said at the beginning, this game is pulling me in. Because of the difficulty, not so much in combat. I haven't found myself getting knocked out too much, especially because my I have a wizard and the wizard does have that heal ability. But because um, it takes a while to get money uh, to be able to buy things and you have to spend a lot of those resources just repairing your items uh, and the rarity of items as well because of all of those things, you just sort of want to go to another dungeon and get more loot again just so that you can upgrade. So that's the kind of game, that's the right level of difficulty for me. I think the threat system is the right amount of pushing your characters forward so that they don't dilly-dally but not too punishing. There is a lot of randomization. There is a lot of swinginess with the D100 system. But again, there's enough here that I found to be intriguing and fun that I am totally sucked into this game. Now, for those of you who did watch my video a while ago with Dungeon Crawl, another print and play, you can check that out here if you haven't seen that. Um, how does this game stack up to Dungeon Crawl? And I will say personally for me, especially as a solo experience, I, I like this game. Now, this is a lot crunchier. This rule set is way more crunchy and way more in depth than Dungeon Crawl. So if you want a simplified version, definitely. And so here's the order that I would do. Do not play regular Hero Quest. I just think it's too simple. It's too mundane. If you have a hero quest board, you should play dungeon crawl as sort of your next level of complexity. Combat isn't complex at all, but in what dungeon crawl gives you is the upgrade ability, the, that desire like RPGs in order to level up. And it gives you a whole campaign system. So that is a great sort of next step from hero quest. But if you want a little bit more refined, a little bit more uh, baked, and finished system, I think Dungeoneers is a good step into complexity and into gameplay. So that's sort of the tier that I would go. If you're, and especially if you're playing with kids, I would definitely not play Dungeoneers. Um, if you find it difficult to manage for heroes because there is a lot of paperwork to be found, he did just come out with a companions expansion and that enables you to have mercenaries come and fill out some of the roles and they are much, much simpler to keep track of in terms of their stats and abilities. The downside is they cost uh, money. And like I said before, money is hard to come by in this game. And because of that, it would be painful to be paying 100, 200 coins uh, to have a mercenary join you in an adventure or campaign. Hope you enjoyed this video and that this was helpful for you. Again, check out my links in the descriptions below for all the resources as well as my Patreon page. And you'll have an opportunity to be chosen by Bob the Beholder to receive this whole set that you see here, the, the Ancient Evil City Crawler, also a copy of Dungeoneers. Happy gaming, happy hobbing. We'll see you next time.